free for a number of clients for a while. And it started with a, with a couple of law firms. And um, one of the law firms was doing work for banks. And banks tend to be probably the biggest users of security. Let me just check to see what Jerry's saying here. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, so so we've had um, some, in we've, we've done some work with the banks and we know exactly where they want to be. And the problem with them is that they are very, very tight about a lot of stuff. Um, you're dealing with credit card information, you're dealing with, with, with money. And when they when the banks get involved in that kind of stuff, obviously they want top level security. So a lot of what I'm going to present today is going to be more of a, um, a residential version of the same kind of thing and not exactly the same information because it doesn't go as deep as it did, but many of the hints and touches are going to be exactly the same. Hi, Ted. Um, and uh, so we've got, uh, we've got some things going on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start now. Um, let me see, just get the share screen going. And okay. And here we go. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the first page. We start off with security. And we're talking about personal security mostly. And then it comes into network and hardware. So all these three things come together and that becomes our security that we're gonna talk about and then I'm gonna to describe to you a number of ways we can deal with it. Now, part of security is gonna be external threats and that's usually where it comes from. You're not gonna really be seeing a lot of problems and, and questions coming from inside your own network, especially at a house. It's probably not something you're going to see unless, of course, you're going through a very, met no, we won't talk about that. Um, so external threats are things that are going to happen. Some of them are things called phishing, which we'll talk about. Another thing is social engineering, which is really a cute thing and you got to watch out for. Um, and there's theft. Um, you know, sometimes it, 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 it's hard to, um, to steal a password or, or, or get an encryption key. But you know what? It's really easy to steal an entire computer system. And, and nine times out of 10, when you hear that, that such and such an organization has had a breach, it's because somebody left their laptop on the train and it was not protected well and suddenly, they, or, or a thumb drive or whatever, and all the data is available and people are reading it directly off of the, off of the, uh, the drives. So those kinds of things happen and we have to watch out for all of them. So it's sometimes, you know, it's, it's easier sometimes to steal the entire computer than it is to try and find a password. There's guessing and cracking. Um, that's where you, where you send things through and you use usually um, things, we'll, we'll describe those later on, but it's all about security and there's levels of security. And you'll notice the theme of circles. It's all about surrounding yourself with circles of security. And the idea is to go from the inside to the out and you want to make sure that you start with the things you can control, obviously. Okay, we can't control what happens outside of our own uh, location, but we can control what happens on our devices and in our offices and in our homes. Okay, so start with the things you can control. So one of the things that we talk about are authenticators. Okay, authenticators are things that you can use to get into a system. Um, sometimes people will have an ID badge or a cryptographic, cryptographic key. Now you may not think you have that and you may not think you've used it, but if you've got an Apple Watch um, and you use it to open your computer, that's a cryptographic key. Um, if you have a, uh, sometimes you're going to be asked at times by different people to in input a code. They'll, they'll send you a code uh, when you change your Google password or you log in from a different device, they'll send you a six digit code. And, and that's an authenticator that the cryptographic key, they're going to send it to you. You can only use it in that one place. Then it goes on. The next kinds of things you're going to be doing are, are fingerprints. Some computers use that or other biometric data. That's something we don't usually see in, in a household, but there are places where people are using other things to, to log into their system. Sometimes it may be um, a retinal scan. Um, this is not something you're going to see in a house, obviously. And the last one is something you know, which is a password. Okay, so passwords are, are memorize secrets. They really are. And you really have to think about them. And the way you put them together, um, you know, you've got all kinds of different ways to talk about them. There's passwords and pins are the same thing. It's a secret value that you have to choose and make memorable to yourself. Okay. Now, it really has to be memorized. Because um, if it's not, it becomes 
difficult to stick to save and, and, and remember. And one of the problems with these things is, I don't know if you've ever gone into a bank lately and, and you tried to get a new account and you sit, sit at the desk with the charming person who's doing it and they'll be reaching for about four or five different sheets and, and looking up passwords because they've got to set you up on this part and that part and the other part. And, and I was in the bank one time and there were about 15 or 16 different passwords that the woman had to enter in order to create an account for me. And she pulled them off of a card which she kept under her keyboard. That's not secret, okay? You have to be able to memorize them. Passwords should be between 16 and 24 characters. And phrases or old addresses are excellent passwords. One of the rules of passwords is you don't wanna have something that is um, a dictionary word. So anything that's in a dictionary shouldn't be in your password necessarily. But if you string them together, that's okay. We put a phrase together. If you lived at 123 Main Street when you were a kid, and no one can get that information out of you because it's something that yeah, was so far in the... Sorry? Security. Computer security. Right. If, you, if you're so far back, if you're so far... If everyone can mute, if you, unless you want to speak, it'd be great. Um, but if, you're, if, you're, um, if, you, if you think about an old, an old address, that's something that no one's gonna remember that you're not gonna be able to tell it and I can't social engineer it out of you. We'll talk about that in a bit, okay? So um, you shouldn't, we shouldn't be changing. There's, there, there's a tendency in some places and they're using an old version of the National Institute of Science and Technology, NIST um, information. It comes out of, out of uh, the US and Washington. And, and they put together a list of pass, of, of security suggestions. And in one of them, they suggested that you change your password every 30 days. So you've probably been involved in one of those things where they'll issue a 12 letter password that's got all kinds of different symbols and things in it. And they change it every 30 days. No one can remember that you write it down someplace. And usually, I mean, I can go into an office and, and, and say, I'm going to find your password. And they go, ha ha ha, can't. Open the drawer and there it is sitting on a, on a post-it note. Sometimes it's right on the computer screen. Right, so how good is that password if, if it's right there for you? However, if you've got a memorized password, right, and most people have a memory of a goldfish, um, memorized passwords should only be changed if the subscriber requests a change. If you need to have something changed, then do it. But unless there's evidence of a need for it, you don't have to change them. And all characters are, may be acceptable. They're talking about including emojis now because emojis have become um, so widespread you're gonna find that, that your computer operating system is going to have them in the next little while that you can use them. We know they're on the phones, they know they're all over the places, but, but you can use all kinds of different things. And the last, you know, last is don't write your password down ever, memorize it. So how are you gonna memorize something that, that, that works, okay? So obviously someone can steal your written password, right? They can guess it. They can do the dictionary account. They can eavesdrop as you're putting in your password um, and you have to think about it because most places the computer puts a series of black dots on the screen, which means you can't read it and you miss it if you're going too long and you've got something crazy and you have to write it down and you write it down and someone's standing over your shoulder and they can see it or take a photograph of it. And there you go, they've eavesdropped it. Fishing and farming we'll talk about in a second. There we go. So fishing is when you use a, it's a fraudulent attempt. So um, this is an example of a fish. Okay, this purports to be from Apple. And as you can see on the bottom, it says copyright Apple. It says, dear customer, click here to verify your account. We've all received these, we all see them. And they've got a couple of things that, that always happen in these things. It's a generic greeting. If they really wanna talk to you, they're gonna say, dear Alan Budman, well, not for me, but for Alan. Um, and they're gonna say, and if you don't see your own name, if it just says, dear customer, you gotta really be suspicious because it's not Probably, it's probably not real. It could have a forged link in it. So if you look at, if you roll your mouse over a link in an email, it will always divide, divulge what the, what the actual address is gonna be. It'll tell you, it'll say, instead of coming out with um, www.apple.com, it will show you where it's from. We'll get to that in a second. These are also, you're also going to get them from places you might go. So uh, today, as a matter of fact, I got one from Chase Bank, which is what we have the FJMC accounts at. I got an FJ, I got one. I looked at it. It was a fake. 
but I'm getting them from every different bank in the world because my email address has been in different places. It's all over, it's on the internet, it's in different So you're always gonna get them. So there's also, there's a couple of tips you can get too. That the, 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 if, you, if you ever happen to click on one of the links and you get to the, the phishing site, you're gonna notice the poor resolution. The graphics are not gonna be crisp and sharp. You may see some, some, um, some edging around them where they've blown it up into a larger size or something. So if it doesn't look right, it's probably not right. Also check the URL that it came from. So if you look at the URL that I put in there, it says first generic bank ABC domain dot right account update. Well, if you look at the first part, yeah, it's from first generic bank. That's where I go. If you look after that, right, then it tells you what the actual domain is. And you can tell the actual domain is always the two sets of characters surrounding that last dot in the name. So here it's obviously abcdomain.com. That's where it's from. I can set up in the, in the DNS settings of any domain that I run, I can set up the same kind of thing. So it'll say something else. You know, you guys know that we've done, you can use it for good purposes too. Um, anyone who's registered for a convention knows we use convention.fjmc.org as the URL for the, for the, um, for the site. And we've actually had to put www.fjconvention.fjmc because people insist on putting www. The www is part of the name and it has to be, all these parts have to be in the DNS record. They're not there, it's not gonna work, but you can surprise somebody by giving them something that's not real. Um, and if you look, you're always, you're usually gonna see that those, those sites are not secure. And you guys know how to find a secure site? See if the site's secure? Usually on the top in the, in the, in the address bar, there will be a lock showing someplace on that bar. It depends, different, different browsers show it different ways, but you're gonna find a lock, a little uh, green or, 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 or blue lock on the top. If you move your mouse over it and you click on it, it will give you information about the actual domain and who's running. it. Now, this sometimes has some issues because if you're running a number of domains on, on a particular one machine, there may be some crossover and they may not give you an exact Thing. But if you can't see a lock and it's coming from someplace that should be locked and it should be secure, then you got a problem. The other part is if you look at the URL, it says HTTP in the one I've given you as an, as, an, as an example, it should say HTTPS. It's a different protocol. It encrypts the, it encrypts the entire um, transaction you're having with the, with the uh, website and it shows better. It shows you that that, that person is actually got a certificate someplace. If there's no S on there, it really treats the, the, the URL completely differently in the server. Servers treat those things um, differently and, and it will not work. If you put an S into a, into a site that doesn't have one, you're gonna get a null resort, result. If you don't have the S in the one that does have it, it will automatically go to the S site. It'll go to the HTTPS without you having to do anything. So it's an easy way to, to see if something's going on. So, um, threats to your password, again, social engineering. Um, don't take online questionnaires, okay? Um, you guys know what the, what the, at one point was the most common um, designator for, for uh, authenticator for, for, uh, for yourself, used to be your mother's maiden name, right? But because of Facebook and other places, it's not hard to figure out what someone's mother's maiden name is. Those things can be found through all kinds of social engineering. You look through all of those things. So don't reveal the authentication secrets to anybody. I had a situation one time where I signed up for one of the rewards cards at, 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 a, at, a, at a drug store and they wanted all of, the, all of the authentication secrets that the bank would want. I said, no, I don't need this. They said, why not? I said, you're asking the questions that are wrong. Oh, you don't have to, you don't have to give them. Someplace in their files, they have all the information about a number of people who didn't say no. So be very careful the way you do. They, if somebody's asking for the information and you don't need, you don't feel you want to give it, don't give it to them. Just ignore it, okay? And you should always avoid the use of them that's going to put you into a risk of social engineering. Um, the um, the uh, affinity cards, um, Facebook, any kind of online presence. Um, when they, whenever somebody's talking about something, if they're talking. As an example, usually they'll talk about, one of the questions you'll be asked every once in a while is, 
is wh what was the city your parents met in? Okay, normal question, you're gonna see it all the time. So there's a hint that came out of the last NIST piece that said, fake the answers. Don't give them anything that's possible to be used, right? If they ask where your parents were met, say Mars, tell them it was on Jupiter. It doesn't matter, it, it should be, give them, a, give them an answer. You're gonna remember because it it's so outrageous. Who's your favorite cousin, right? Noah, right? Just give them something that's not real that you're gonna remember and just keep track of those things. If they're simple and outrageous, you're gonna remember them, they're gonna work. Um, and the questionnaire answers, you know, if they're, if they're security related, you're in, you, can be in, you can be in big trouble if you give somebody that because they just have to go in and say they faked your password. I don't know if, it's, if, you, if you guys have heard about it, but there are people who are uh, calling cell phone companies and asking to change a number, right? I've got a new, I'm changing my, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna sign up with uh, ABC cell phone. I call them up and I say, I'd like to change my number. This is my number and I'm actually giving them Miles' number. Right, and they say, "Well, what's your what's your authentication information?" And I may know it because I've looked on his I've looked on his Facebook page, or there's information there, and I might be able to pass on that information and have his cell phone transferred to me. Which means the next time I go to his bank or his or anything, I'm sorry, Miles, I'm not picking on you, um, but but I may be able to go to a bank or or, or other places and get the information because they're going to ask me as as an authenticator to send me a code to my cell phone. I got his cell phone right in my hand. And you don't know about this until you realize that you haven't received a call for a few days. Right? Suddenly your phone's not working. You haven't received a call. And, and what happened? Well, you gotta watch out. That's one of the things you have to watch out for. And that's the reason you don't wanna give information that you don't have to. So when we get back to passwords for a second, I always figure there's, you should have at least three different levels of passwords, okay? The first one is the, is the easy one. If you're, if you're signing on to a newspaper website, just give them something that's gonna satisfy the requirements that you can remember, that you can use all the time, that you never have to worry about coming back to, that if, if you forget it, you're not gonna forget it because it's so simple, right? Could be the name of your first car, right? Corvette, Chevette, um, Ford, whatever. Whatever you're gonna give them, just give them something simple. And then you're gonna have a another, another um, level which you're gonna be using for personal information like um, perhaps Facebook, but other places where you're gonna be using it, perhaps places like Amazon, where there's a possibility of purchasing something that you can always return it. Um, you shouldn't use your work password for those, for, for those pieces because if there's a cross, if somebody breaches at work, then you're gonna have your information on, they're gonna have your information and they can go to those things. So be careful about separating those things. Your bank, password should not be your email password. Don't use the same passwords for the both, for the same things. Your email password should be tight and, and, and should, should follow all the qualifications. I'm gonna show you how we do that in a second, but make sure you don't use them and make sure you use something that's different and, and easy to remember. And, and anything that, as I mentioned before, anything that requires a login, lowest level, don't do anything else. So here's some passwords, okay? Simple password, um, Rover 20, easy to remember. It's got an exclamation mark, which really helps it in terms of the um, not being able to be uh, to be guessed. It's something that you have to do. And if you put any kind of extra character in, a medium one, I, I added an extra zero and and the, uh, the pound sign. Well, that brings that password up to 10 characters. It's not so hard to remember. It's, it's easy to, you know, something you can remember. It's 10 characters and it's probably pretty good to, we will I'll show you how to check it, but it's easy to check to make sure how good it's gonna be. When you get to something complex, right, there's one that's even further. Now that's an old address. I never lived there, but, but that's something we can remember and we can use. And then you get to the last one, the perfect one, is you put Rover lives at 10 Downing Street, right, <laughs> exclamation. Now, I'll show you how good that one is. We went into a lot, one of the law firms and we started with the passwords and I checked them. And there's a, look at the bottom of the, of the screen there. There's a, um, this is the original place where I found this information. There's a place called howsecureismypassword.com. Really easy to use. You put your password in and it tells you how long it would take to crack your password. And it does it really quickly. I always thought, I, I, I've thought about the fact that there's no login, so they're not really keeping track of you, but it's a great way to check and, and collect passwords. 
Um, this is one that somebody was using password. It's P A five five W O R D exclamation mark. She thought it was great. Nine digits last all in nine hours. Um, these are eight hour, eight, eight digit ones, and they would last 21 hours according to that site. Um, you get to nine, they're talking one month and 25 days. You get to uh, 10, you're talking nine years. That's only by adding an extra digit, right? And the difference between Mark and Pete was Pete had an exclamation mark. You go to the 11 digits, you're talking 589 years, right? Seems decent. Um, 11 again, you add some exclamation marks, you're talking 1600 years. If you add a digit at that point, you're talking 36,000 years. If you get to 13, you're talking 2 million years. Now, that's, you may la you're laughing at that, but, but the fact is I wouldn't let them use a password that wasn't good for a couple million years, seriously. They're not hard to remember. And, and, and the, the rover, you'll see in a second. Okay, then we get to some other ones. They got 14 digits, 140 million years. Great idea. Okay. Then there was a person who did 40, who added some extra characters. And this is um, 4 trillion years. Okay, not bad for a 14 digit password. The one we talked about before, Rover lives at 10 Downing Street, exclamation mark, which is really easy to remember. I mean, that's not a hard thing to remember, right? That's something like a, a million times the age of the universe is what the figuring is as to how long it would take to crack that. I think that one's pretty secure, right? But it's not hard to remember. And you could remember, you could have a, a password like that that, that's easy to do, easy to remember. It will work very, very well, and it will keep you awake. And that's 27 characters. If I asked you to remember 27 characters in, in a password, you'd be hard pressed to do it. But if you make it into a phrase, suddenly it becomes easy. And if you add a couple of extra characters, something that's not on the regular keyboard, right? You have your numbers, you have your letters, you have the capitals, you have everything you need in there. That really works well. So suddenly we're going to see we see that that it can be really easy. So we're really talking about establishing a security policy, right? And, and that, that's how we access requests for information. Right? And we, we make sure we, we allow things that we, we want to allow and we restrict things that we don't want to allow. So I'm gonna move out of that right now because we, we only have a little while here. I'm gonna talk about networks, your home network, okay? So um, when, you get a, when you start a home network, the first thing to do is to change all your default passwords. The new router comes in from, this, from, the, from the phone company or from the um, cable company, and it's got a default password inside it. And you look at it and you say, that's, my, that's great. I'm going to use it as my, I'm going to read it off the side. I'm going to put it into my computer, and I'm going to say, that's my, that's my password to get on my network. That somebody someplace has a record of that, and there are ways to keep track of those things. And as someone's driving down the street, and as if you remember, Google got into a lot of trouble for doing this. They were, when they were sending their cars to do the street view, they were also collecting internet passwords. The way they got them was going through and seeing that, that the person was on a particular brand of uh, cable or, or, or uh, telephone because they always told you that it was, um, they always have the name of the company in it and uh, they could figure out what your password was and allow you to allow somebody who has the technology to walk to sit in front of your house and use your your um, your online presence as their own. And that's not so terrible, except that one of the law firms I deal with was a, was a criminal law firm. And I actually had to go in and be the expert witness on a child pornography case because the guy was being charged with, with pornography offenses because he had stuff on his computer. And we said, well, first thing, the computer was, was a used computer, so that doesn't count. The second thing, they said, well, he has an open network. We saw stuff was being downloaded. And we said, right, it's an open network. He was an idiot, but you can't, you can't fault him for doing that. So if you, if you have an open password or password that's easily found, there are possibilities of, of people coming and, and checking and seeing what you've downloaded because of where, your IP address, et cetera and you could be in trouble. You don't, need to, you don't need to find the services of a lawyer, just change the default passwords. You should also make sure that anything that's in the Internet of Things, IoT, are not set to default. So you've got things like your um, Apple TV box, your Chromecast, um, perhaps a set of uh, phones, 
you may have a security camera system, uh, a refrigerator now that has internet access to it. All of those things are in the internet of things. And if the password that controls them is left at the default, you can have a lot of trouble. Absolutely keep a list of those things. Keep it in your computer where it's protected. Don't print it out, but make sure you have that list that you can keep it and change them as best you can. Change as many as you can to make sure that you're not using a generic password on every item that you have. Because um, there, was a big, there was a big problem with the set it with a, a, one, a number of brands of security cameras that were used that had default. It was always admin admin as the password. If you were able to get to that network, you could find a way to get into that network by using the admin admin, and you were able to go into the network and find out what was going on. It's not as critical in the home, but I dare say that most of us have our banking and our investments and the rest of our stuff on our computers, which are accessible if somebody has a password in the network. If you leave it open, it doesn't matter how passwords are every place else. You have to look at the weakest device. It's like a chain, okay? I suggest that people purchase their own network devices. Um, get your own router. Uh, for a couple of reasons. The first one is you've probably got a better chance of, of, of extending the, the, uh, the passwords and putting different ones on them. But you also have the, the, the option, if ever you change your um, supplier, if you go from the cable company to the cell, to the phone company for your internet, you don't have to worry about reestablishing passwords in all your devices. You've got something secure. You don't have to change them. And changes, is, changes are where you have the problems. Anytime you're make major changes, that's when the, the issues can come up in terms of, uh, of lack of security. And then if, you, if, if the router goes dead on you and you have to take it back to the store or, the, or, the, or they come and change it, you just tell them to, to change it to bridge mode, it's called. It'll automatically work when you plug it into your own one. And you've also got that extra level of security because the first, when, they, when someone comes in from outside and they try and get into your system, they're going to be stopping your router to start with. And then once they get past the router, they've got another set. And it's like the old story about the guy who has a dog in his house, right? And the thief comes down the street. Doesn't matter how big the dog is, he'd rather not deal with it, he goes to the next house. Send people to the next place. And if you don't think people are trying to get into your, into your network at home on a regular basis, take a look if you can at your logs on your router. If you have the ability to do that, you'll find that you're being pinged and checked um, every second. And many of the, um, of, of the IP addresses that are doing that come from China and Russia. Um, and, and that's just where they come from. Um, and you, you wanna be sure, you wanna be sure you're keeping people out of your system. Um, always use a 24 character network password. And you should always make sure that you establish a guest network with a much less complex password. So if I'm gonna be visiting um, one of you guys and, and you say, well, I'd like to use your internet, you say, oh sure, here's our password. If you're giving me the internet, the regular internet password for the one you use in the house, it's really not a good idea because I've now got access to all the devices in your network. Right? Whether or not, um, if you set everything up in the regular way, there's a possibility that I could get in from your living room or from the front, from, from, from the street in front of your house if I'm just sitting in a car. Those things are available. So if you establish a guest network and many routers, and, and that's why you wanna get your own, will allow you that guest network, you can give it something simple and you can let people into it from, you know, if somebody comes over here, use the guest network, that's the one. They also can't get into your regular network because it's usually a different network set. So it's, it's not the one that has the printers and the rest of the computer, it's a basic network and allows them to get onto the internet and nothing else. It really makes it really makes a difference. Always check to make sure your router's firewall is running. If it's not running, you could have a, you, you will have a problem. And if you have a chance to, simple is best, use an ethernet cable because a cable, it's show and tell. If you use a cable to connect, you're not using that network password. Um, you're not using the wireless network and your information is not going back and forth. And it reduces the traffic in the house. So the actual traffic that's going back and forth between your router and the, and the computers is gonna be lessened because you're connected by wire on that one at least. And that's gonna make sure that you don't have as much uh, flying through the air, it's going to be flying through the wires, it's much quicker and better in that way. So if we're talking about hard hardware for a second. You got to secure your hardware, as you said, always sign in with a password. If you're talking about your computer, same thing. Make sure that you don't set your computer so it just 
turns on when you're in the room. It should always be something you have to sign into. And it should be a fairly complex password. Don't just use ABC123. Somebody can sit there and get it in about 10 minutes. It's not a hard thing to do. There's a list of common passwords that's available on the internet. Take a look for it. I, I, you can probably find the URL for it, but take a look for it and see if you can find it and see if your own personal password's on that list. If it is, change it right away. If it's not, change it anyways. Um, you should always turn on the lost item locator. Um, all of these phones have them um, and many other devices so that if, you, if, the, if the device is missing, uh, you can you can get into a central site and they will find the password. They will find the device for you. And if the device is on or it's on the network, or even if it's not connected to a Wi-Fi network, it will still be able to be found. Um, when the device connects to a Wi-Fi network, there's a there's an in, there's a there's a negotiation signal that goes out to every um, network when you do that, and that's in the clear. It has to be made so that so that your device can find the network. They put the location information in that negotiation um, pass so that, so that it doesn't matter if they didn't connect it to the Wi-Fi. If the device is on and the Wi-Fi is on in the device and you're near a Wi-Fi network, it will automatically tell where the item is, okay? If you can encrypt your hard disk, it's a great idea to do so. It's really a wonder. It, it, it's very easy on most systems to do it. It takes a little while, can take, 10, 12 hours to do the first time, do it overnight, um, let it run. And most, but most machines will allow you to run them at the same time as you're, as you're doing the encryption. But it's always a good idea to have that encrypted hard disk. If the machine gets lost, the lost item locator doesn't work, you still could, you, you don't have to worry about your data being stolen from you. You're really not getting that breach that you would have had otherwise. And, and strongly, resist the use of USB thumb drives for storing information. Send stuff back and forth, um, you know, use it with what we used to call sneaker net, where you take something on a, on a USB key and you move it across another computer, great. But don't store your financial data on this. And believe me, I've had that with a number of clients where they've told me, oh, everything's great, it's on the USB key. And I said, where's the key? It's in my purse. What happens if you lose your purse? Oh, well, not a good idea. Um, make sure you back up all of your devices. Um, if you plug your phone in, it should be backed up. You're plugging your computer, there's gonna be a backup someplace. Um, I'm kind of renal about backing up, so I have about four different ways I back up everything because I'm worried about a loss. In, in my case, if I lost the information, I would be out of business. I couldn't function anymore. Most of us are somewhat the same way where we've got all of our information, all of our personal information, to do with everything in life is on the, on these machines. And if they're not backed up and they go bad on them, it, will, you're, you, you're gone, you're dead. You can't do anything. Um, and, and they all will, it will happen one day to every device. Every device will die. It just happens. Um, I talked about multiple, multiple backups. I like to have them local and offsite. Um, somebody said to me one time, I've got my, I've got my backup over here. I'm fine, I don't need the cloud backup. Right, so the fire is gonna stop there at that one, right? It all, it doesn't matter. If, if, if there's gonna be disaster that takes place and you have to recover, yes, recovering from an online backup service is slow as and lasts. You're gonna wish you had something else to do with your life. But if that's the only way you can do it, you're gonna be thankful that you did it and it's great. There are multiple ways to back up online um, and, and all kinds of things that will do it automatically. You turn it on and set it up and go, um, there, I found one a while back, um, Zools that I'm using that was lifetime backup, two terabytes for like 50 bucks. Um, don't have to worry about it, plugs it in, let it run. It'll do multiple computers. Um, I also have another, that's, I use one on one machine and something else on, on the business machines. But all those things are able to, you, you, you should have an online backup as well as your local backup. And if you, if you use the cloud, make sure you're using a secure service. There are some, some that are better than others. Um, you know, uh, I, would, I wouldn't use, I, find, I am very wary of using Google um, as a, an online backup service because Google will tell you uh, right away that you know, even if you're using the 20 gigabyte account that you don't pay for, the reason they're doing that is because they're using your data. Now they may not be using your data in a way that you don't want them to, or they may be using it in a way you don't want them to. 
how many times have you looked for a particular uh, vacation location or, or new item? And the next time you go on to Google, that's the first thing on the list. Well, surprise, they found out because they were looking at your information. It's all there. And the next thing to consider is a VPN. So VPN is a personal security item that you can use. It's a virtual private network. Does, every, does anybody have one now? Bruce does, okay. So basically, and, and Bob, and as only guys I can see right now, I'm not sure about anybody else, let's see. Oh, Ted, you don't have one, do you? Yes, you actually do, I think. All right, so, so basically a VPN is an app you can put on your computer or your phone, and, and it allows you to, to, to change your identity and your address and move it away from the rest of the internet. Okay. So a VPN, um, let me just get going here. There we go. Um, it encrypts all the information going back and forth. It used to be called a tunnel, where everything that goes along the VPN is, is put into, into an encrypted form, both back and forth. No one can read it if they, if, if they intercept it, but it's, it's secure between you and the VPN server. And it can protect your data, keeps it safe and anonymous. You don't have to worry about it. And it's really a great way to do it. Now, one of the things that you can do with the VPN is you can mask your location. Sometimes when we travel, we try and access things like our bank, okay? So first thing, you, if, you, if you're sitting in an airport lounge and you're, using it, and you're using your computer to access your banking information, you will rapidly find that your bank is empty in the morning because it's the first place that people find and steal your password and come in. It, it happens all the time. It happens to people who should know better, right? But it happens. Use a VPN and suddenly that can't happen. So you're sitting at the airport, turn the VPN on. You're sitting in, a, in any place that's not in your own home, turn the VPN on and, and use it to make that connection, okay? You don't want to use it in your home. And the reason you don't want to use it in your home is because um, if, you, if, you, if you use it in your home, Oh, wait, let me go through here. So you want to make sure your VPN is effective. You, there's a couple of names that I use. One of them is, is VPN Unlimited. They have a service, another lifetime thing for like 30 bucks. Um, you can find it on uh, Slashdot, uh, has a store. It's a great place to find some things. And, and every once in a while, they, they'll come along with a, an unlimited plan. The one I got has five devices. And every once in a while, I get a, I get a, a a notice that I should upgrade it to a more to a better plan. I've got the unlimited version for five devices. That's the best plan. It cost me forty dollars three or four years ago. It's great. One of the things you should, there's there's some you shouldn't use. I used one one time called the non VPN. It basically was was crap. It didn't do anything. Um, one of the things you want you can use a VPN for is if you're traveling and sometimes you'll find that that a bank or other sites will restrict you by location. You can only view a particular site if you're in your home country. If you use a VPN, you can pretend you're in your home country and still use that site. So uh, if, you, if your bank test says no, if, you, if you're sitting in Southeast Asia and you wanna see what's on Netflix, you're probably gonna have a restriction on there, but you turn on your VPN, pretend you're in your home country and you can watch whatever you want to. Uh, there was a time when I was, when, when, when at the last uh, World Zionist Congress, um, it was during the baseball playoffs and my team was in. The only problem was I could watch it on the VPN. I could do it. It just started at three in the morning, which was a problem. Um, it wasn't so bad for me, but for the guys from Chicago, they started about five in the morning. So they didn't know whether they were to bed or not. We didn't, we just ended up kind of watching the end of the game. Um, so make sure that you keep your, you, you keep yourself safe, circles of security, um, your doc, your data is your life, and you want to keep it confidential. So keeping it safe. That's the end here. I'll open this up and the share. Um, and to stop the sharing. We're back to there. Anybody have any questions? Uh, Stan. Yes. Uh, it's Bob. I just wanted to point out one thing about VPNs. There's all kinds of rates things out that you can compare and shop for for VPNs. Nord is like one of the best or highest rated. Uh, but yep. there's something called logging that some VPN uh, providers do and some don't. Okay. So if you really want to be absolutely anonymous, you look for one that doesn't yeah. log, log in, yeah, log no. your, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. your yeah. traffic, right? Yeah. 
yeah, and, and, and that's mostly that's mostly in the case where you're doing something you want you don't want anyone to know about. Well, well like, I have a question. Are you, are you are you saying that that deal I do with the Nigerian oil minister is really not good? Is that what you're saying? Um, unless unless you've taken money from him, it's not good. <laughs> there are people who spend their time trying to scam the Nigerians. Oh yes, there are. And and sometimes it works. Dan? Hi, Miles. You were talking about passwords and ones that you can remember only. Yes. Uh, I use a LastPass, which enables me to right. uh, track of them on uh, a, um, a single site. Yes. But they're always prompting me to let them create uh, new um, passwords made out of a jumble of letters and characters, and I've always been reluctant to do that. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? No, I agree with I agree with you. I, I think it's I think it's important to be able to remember your passwords. Um, anything that anything that, that that's a jumble that has you know characters that it just can't be if it's unreadable, you're not gonna remember it. Right? Well, well, the thing, idea is that you would use LastPass to always yeah. keep track of it, but right, you can there there are unreliable. Yeah, no, I mean there are a number of different ways to do that, but in the end of the day, Miles, you're sending someone all your passwords. Right, so you have to think about the security implications of giving somebody else all your passwords. If they have a breach, all your stuff is known. If you can remember them and you can, you don't have to write them down. I mean, I've got a list of passwords that I keep, and those are the ones for all the different devices I have. But my main passwords, they're easy. I don't, I don't have to write them down. One of the challenges is that a lot of the places that require passwords, if I if I wanted to use one that I could remember. That every six months they want me to change it and upgrade it to a different password and so to try to remember which ones have been changed from what I started with it's yeah I have that I have that with a, a, one of the credit card companies I use to pay credit cards and they keep asking for a new password every 90 days you know won't, 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 won't let me do complete the transactions unless I give it to them so what I started doing was either adding a date into it so I you know this is whatever whatever 29 and an exclamation mark on the end of it, so they accept it. And the next time they want it to be changed, I'll make it 30, right? So it's always available. My mm -hmm. computer remembers them anyways, and as, as yours probably does, right? But this way I have them, and I, keep a, I make sure I know them, I keep a list, whatever. But it's just a matter of, uh, it, it's much better if you can remember them in some way. Um, mm -hmm. And as long as they're, they're moderately comp, use the how secure is my password.net to figure them out and to see what they are. Um, and, and just use that. It really works out well and you can, you can check. Um, you'd be surprised at how minor changes to you know, just the phrase can make it so secure. I mean, you know, 20, 100 times the age of the universe. It's not a bad password. I just wanted to mention the, the Find My Phone uh, app or my iPhone. Um, I actually had my iPhone stolen last year and um, I was able to track it on my, on my laptop and they called the police and um, I actually had to give the police my Apple ID password. And they, this policewoman uh, basically tracked it on her phone. She said, I'll be back in a half an hour with your phone. And she got yeah. it back for me. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Then you, and then you changed your password after. That. Oh yes. But it was incredible because <laughs> like I could see when the phone was coming back, I could actually yep. watch it on the map. So the stuff that really does work. Kind of like watching the Uber come to you. Yeah, kind of like that. And by the way, the VPN, it's great for porn, really. <laughs> Sounds it's like a new men's body. issues program. Yeah, really. But, yeah. but on a cleaner, it's great for watching out of market uh, uh, ball games too. And yeah. Football. Like I, I, I had CBS All Access, and I wanted to watch Patriots games, which because they weren't local, they wouldn't mm -hmm. let me watch. So I just VPNed into Boston, and uh, yeah. most VPNs will, will give you a list of servers they can use, and there, you know, there must be about fifteen or twenty locations in each country, and mm -hmm. you can just, you can zoom into the place you want to, and then find the find the stuff you want to watch. It is not as fast as 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 it would be normally because you have to take that encryption into account. But to watch a game, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's great for that. 
Stan, this is wonderful. Thank you. And Aaron, thank you for setting this all up. Thank you, Stan. Appreciate it. This whole deal was Stan's idea. And we thank Stan and Tom for uh, getting the ball rolling. And uh, it was going to be even more. Look for, look for more ads and more information. We have so far, I think, about seven of them scheduled. Yep. And there'll, and there'll be more adding on. We're so on the website. You're, are you're recording, right? Uh, are you going to post the recording somewhere? I am recording it right now as we speak. And but even the password yeah. protected and not tell you the password. Right. Exactly. So, just to, to let you know, there's two, more, there's two things the, that aren't really on, that may not be on the schedule right now. One of them is the, the, the regular weekly Talmud class, which takes place Thursday at 8 uh, Eastern. Um, and that, I, if you just send me an email, I'll send you the, the link for it. And there's also going to be for the